Hello everyone, this is a tutorial on how to build a dual rotating frame type of kinetic sculpture. I've had a lot of letters about how to build the bat, which was prominent on, on the earlier video on Simtar. Uh, so I designed this one as a tutorial. It's a pretty simple one to build. And it's got a couple lenses on it, so you can see right through to the mechanism that triggers it and there's not much in it. It really requires about three one-foot pieces of hardwood, one piece of brass dowel, a quarter-inch dowel, and a bit of machining, although you could cut this with a scroll saw and glue it together as well. It has a constant torque spring in it, so we'll have to talk about how that works. It winds up uh, by gripping the back section and winding the forward section uh, counterclockwise. Uh, and then you set them free. Uh, the veins are held on with uh, magnets, so there are no screws or anything like that in this sculpture. There's a few C-clips in addition to the brass rod, and you can see stuck at various ends of the uh, platforms uh, some magnets and uh, so on that I use to add weight to various sections. This sculpture is not completely finished. It uh, still needs finishing and a little bit more weighting, but it works well enough to use now as a tutorial. So I thought I'd get that over with and we'll talk about how to build one of these things and uh, tune it up and make it work. Um, you may want to copy this one directly. If so, the plans will be on Gerotic's site. Uh, along with DXFs and photographs of each piece so that you can reproduce them. So to discuss any sort of uh, kinetic motor of this type, we have to start with talking about a spring. And this is a constant torque spring. It's an SV10G160 from Vulcan Springs. At least that's as close as I can uh, get to it. This one's a bit old, so its inner tang is a bit different. But you'll notice looking at the center of it, uh, that's where the connection point is. So here is my source spool, which is just a circle of wood cut out of a piece of walnut in this case. I've shoved a bearing into mine uh, just to make it so it can run easier on the brass pin that I'm going to stick it on. Now what we do at that point is wind the spring onto the spool and that reverses it and gives you the tang at the end that you can connect to your device. So to do this we just pull the end of uh, the spring onto the uh, wooden wheel. You don't need to attach it in any way, just holding it there. You then rotate the spring around that wheel repeatedly and when you're finished it will be fully wrapped onto the spool and the connection tang will be hanging off of the end. Uh, you have to be careful not to unwind one of these all the way. It specifies that you always want to leave two or three winds on the wooden reel. So you can either tell the user not to wind up too much or you can add some sort of mechanical stop to stop them from overwinding. When you've wound it all the way onto the spool, it'll look something like this. The messed up end of it is because my device has catastrophically unwound a few times and you often end up bending up the uh, last six inches or so of your spring. It's immaterial and it won't affect the way it works. Now for the purposes of this ticker, I've put a fold at the end of the spring where the tang is and I'm going to fit that into a uh, take-up reel. Uh, you'll see that the spring just looks loosely sprung onto the, onto the source wheel. There is no spring tension like you would normally see in, a, in like a clock spring or anything. Now this is the take-up reel when seen from the top. It's the power pushing mechanism or the ratchet. And I have eight pins in this one which will give you a 45 degree push per trigger. Um, this is developed a little bit less efficiently on its triggering mechanism in order to give us variable power. So if you like, you could use four pins if you'd like a 90 degree push. And you can use as few as one pin to get a 360 degree push. But I would only do that if you had very heavy veins so that your acceleration wouldn't be too fast. You can remove one of the pins, for example, and get a stronger push in one section of its, of its run. But this is as seen from the top, and it's simply a piece of wood with a bearing at the top and bottom. Underneath this, however, is the take-up spool for the spring. So here is that spool from underneath. 
you can see the bottoms of the brass pins and there is also a three quarter inch thick section of a take up spool which is approximately uh, two and a quarter inches across or so and is just meant to roll up the spring. Now a slit was made in that uh, spool in order for the spring to be looped over it and you can see a screw hole beside the slit uh, which is the only screw that's in the device and it just holds a washer to hold the spring onto the uh, pickup reel. So when it begins to roll up the spring, when you begin to wind the uh, mechanism, it's going to wind the spring up in the direction of the arrow. This forces the spring to be reverse rolled onto this take-up spool. And the pressure will be for the original roll to spin up and retake the material as the uh, take-up spool wants to unwind from that reverse pressure of the spring. Like it says in the specifications, it's about a four pound torque at all times on the uh, take up spool once you've wound one or two winds. Not dangerous at all unless you let it go into an uncontrolled run as I'll explain in a moment. So we now flip over the source and take up spool and slide them onto the uh, pins. Now you do this at the same time of course because they're screwed together at this point. The source spool just gets slid onto a brass pin which is hammered into the wood. It doesn't need anything to hold it, just being underneath the source disc will hold it in place. The uh, take up spool is C-clipped on and if you don't own a lathe you can make these C-clips easy enough just by spinning the brass rod in a drill and uh, holding a hacksaw blade to it. It only takes a moment to make a groove. Uh, since all wood varies in thickness, you'd want to make sure that it all fit together. So at this point, when you've put this together, uh, this disc, if you spun it counterclockwise, will wind up energy. And if you were to release it, it will take off. Um, at this point, I would caution against winding it up too much. Uh, it has a surprising amount of energy when it unwinds, and it will spin up to such a speed that it could really hurt you. Uh, if you aren't careful. So from this point forward I would take a bit of caution. Now also on the screen you can see a couple magnets. The smaller arrow is pointing to the magnet that I use instead of using a spring on the ratchet latch and the larger arrow was pointing to a magnet that I only put in to use as a friction glide so that the uh, trigger mechanism can have less friction on its return but uh, because of this arrangement no springs are necessary for this part of the device. Now the latch is just a uh, piece of bloodwood here of a particular shape and a hole drilled through it. It's about three quarters of an inch thick so one side is pocketed out to fit around the wheel and um, there's one magnet in it which corresponds to the magnet the small arrow pointed to in the previous shot and that's the spring. It also holds the latch into the mechanism so you don't need a C-clip or anything. There's just a brass pin hammered into the uh, crescent ring and uh, you just place this on. The magnets will hold it together and hold it in the proper place. From that point on it'll act uh, just like a ratchet. So this is what the bottom plate looks like once you uh, flick your trigger lever on. Again, the lever does not have to be held on with a clip or anything. The attraction of the magnets is enough. And should this pin swing outward as a pin pushes it out of the way, it will snap back to point so that those two magnets point to each other. You can just see the tail end of a magnet pointing out that I use as a glide just to reduce friction. So the only part of the wood that's touching anything is on the shaft and on top of that magnetic glide. The two magnets in the back are actually uh, held just a hair apart uh, by this glide and that pin. Uh, so at this point it's ready to be wound up and turning the pins counterclockwise in this case will wind it up and the latch will begin to click in to hold it. Now here it is under a little bit of tension and you can see that the trigger latch is holding on a pin. Uh, the disc currently wants to spin clockwise but is being held in position. You can see from the orientation of the pins that if anything was to grab a pin and turn it counterclockwise, the trigger latch would temporarily bend out of the way and then flick back from the pressure of the magnet to grab the next pin. So as you wind it, you'll hear it clicking as it clicks up the, uh, uh, through the pins. Hanging on either side of this board, you can see a, couple chunk, a chunk of metal on the left-hand side that I threw on as a weight. And on the right hand side, a couple of small magnets are standing off another magnet. There are three magnets uh, placed in the end of each board that I can use for attaching veins 
and attaching little bits of metal so that I can weight the thing uh, as it's being tuned in. You do have to tune these types of things in in order to make your tr trigger mechanism work properly. So now we have a ratchet, we can wind it up and uh, we want it to release intermittently when something comes against it. So now we come to the mechanism triggering and that's always the tricky part and the part that people want to see. Um, before I explain how this mechanism works, we should take a closer look at that trigger pin because there is one other special thing about it that you do need to see. There's a hole drilled laterally through that trigger mechanism quarter inch hole with a little bar magnet pushed into the hole and one of the adjustments of this device is you can push that bar magnet in or out further into the, the hole or closer to our viewing point here. The magnet can be pushed back or forth uh, approximately an inch so that you can adjust exactly how much, how much magnetism would be seen at the face edge of this trigger. Uh, I'll point to that in the image in a second. Right behind this pin, uh, you'll just see the hint of a hole in the wood, and this is where our quarter inch hole goes from there straight through to the other side. And a uh, bar magnet about a quarter inch long can be positioned anywhere in that channel. It's in the channel just tightly enough that you can tap it back and forth. And this means anything passing this point would feel a magnetic force proportional to exactly where you put that magnet closer to the disc or further away from the disc. That's important in the triggering mechanism that we're going to take a look at. So we'll start our discussion assuming that we have wound up our device somewhat and so it is sitting in this configuration on the bottom panel. The uh, trigger latch is holding a pin and the arrow is pointing uh, at where the magnet is or the magnet hole is in the uh, trigger mechanism. Okay, so here we have the front of the device uh, with its bearing holes, and I have a bearing on both sides of the wood for stability. Uh, I've sunk two lenses into the wood, and I've put some decorative sunglasses from a clockwork orange around the lenses. And then this bottom lens, the one that you can see is quite bright, you can just see the tip of a trigger toggle hanging out. And the brass pin, which is above it, is the toggle pin for this latch. This latch is the key to the uh, device's triggering mechanism, and we'll see that when we flip it over. Okay, so here we can see the uh, bottom of the top, and we have a latch uh, which is movable, and it basically has two positions. Um, what you may not see clearly in this photo is that it is currently hitting a stop in one direction. So this arrow is pointing to the uh, to a little bit of a Q-tip stem, uh, which has been glued into the board, which stops the toggle from moving any further out from the center to that point. And right above it, you will see a, a small magnet, which is set in to use as a spring for, to give this toggle a uh, natural position. So at the moment, the toggle is sitting uh, against its stop, which is this little stem that we've put in. Uh, but it would normally hover right over the magnet that the arrow is currently pointing to. That would be considered the natural position of this latch. And in that natural position, uh, the other end of the latch is inside the radius of the eight pins on the toggle wheel. It wouldn't hit any of them as it rotates. But there's a second position for this latch. So this is the second position of the latch. And in this position, the uh, outside tip of the latch is now outside the radius of the eight pins, which means that if this latch was turning in the right direction, it would hit one of the pins and push on it. Where if it's ending, if it runs in the other direction, a pin would hit the end of the toggle and flick it back to its rest position. So the whole thing about this ticker is which position this latch is in and which direction the top is going uh, when the latch is in that position. Now what moves this latch between the two positions is that magnet that we put in the ratchet trigger mechanism uh, that is its own little tunnel that you tap back and forth. That magnet attracts this latch and either pulls it out to the position it's currently in um, or when this latch hits a pin, it flicks it back into uh, its holding position. 
which we'll explain a bit more graphically. So here we have our mechanism as a drawing, and what I have outlined here in green uh, is hanging on the upper uh, level platform. So if the upper level platform is rotating in this direction, we don't hit anything and everything is clear. Now, every time we pass this point, there is a magnet inside this trigger latch right here, and you can push it back and forth in this direction to set its strength. And it will attract a magnet which is placed inside this trigger right at this point. So this magnet will begin to rotate this vein on this rotational center of its axes and pull it downward. Now, the cover is still rotating clockwise, so an instant from now it's going to hit this pin. When it hits this pin, this latch will rotate back to its rest position up here, missing everything again as it goes around clockwise. Now, when we go counterclockwise, something different occurs. If we take a look at this, and I'm just going to select these objects so that we can rotate on the center axes. When we're going this way, we're clear, but as we come this way, the magnet in the latch is going to begin to attract this latch. So it will begin to rotate this downward and it will hit this pin which will stop its rotation. But remember the entire thing is still rotating in a counterclockwise direction. So I'm going to set the rotation center up here to show that and we continue to rotate up this way. But the magnet is still pulling uh, in this area onto that pawl. So the pawl will turn some more and rotate down this way to keep pointing at these two areas. This will repeat itself as it rotates counterclockwise. And I'll set a new rotation center here and rotate it up. And eventually it will get to the point, and I'm just going to uh, cheat a little bit here. Eventually we will get to this position where we have pushed the pawl out of the way. We're jammed against the pin, so it has no choice but to push the pawl out of the way. The pin on the ratchet will grab this uh, lever at this point, stopping rotation and pushing the outer cover uh, with a force to drag it 45 degrees, at which point uh, the pawl will have snapped back in to capture this pin up here. That will lead us to this point where the ratchet has snapped back in. The pin, uh, this pin, has stopped moving, so this latch will continue on its way uh, counterclockwise until it hits this pin, which is no longer moving. That will snap this lever back up so that it's back in its rest position where it will be uh, able to continuously rotate uh, clockwise without hitting anything until the next time it stops at which point it will eventually sing, swing counterclockwise and repeat the process. Now as it does come around to this point, it will be reattracted by the magnet and you'll hear a click as this lever uh, ticks off of this pin uh, and then goes back to rest position on its way. This magnet that you push in and out of this channel, uh, you adjust it so that the click that you hear as it goes on its free running run is a limited click. You want to lower the intensity of that click. When you get it just right, it won't be a, uh, an annoying click, but it will still operate when it comes back, gets attracted, and tries to push the pawl off of the pin. And that's how this trigger works and how it repeats itself uh, to keep on going. Every time the veins slow down, they are weighted so that the bottom weight of the uh, bottom section and the the uh, bottom weight of the top section give them a natural rest position where the trigger is just about to activate the latch. So this is the natural rest position of the unit. No matter how you weight them, you should weight it so that when you allow them to go at rest, the slight imbalance of the wheel causes that part of the wheel to go to the bottom and this is how the two sections will line up. Because this means you'll always uh, be in this position at maximum power uh, when they're trying to find equilibrium. And that's the point at which this 
Paul will begin to push this latch off of this pin. It happens very quickly as it comes to this position because this latch rotates at the same time that the odor plate holding this latch is rotating in this direction. So it all happens pretty quickly uh, and it makes it very hard to visualize. So that's how a dual rotating frame ticker works. Um, I hope it's been informative. All the parts, plans, and uh, some detailed drawings with measurements will all be posted to the Garotic site within a week um, so that you can try building one of these yourself. It really is uh, fairly simple to build and fun to play with. So I hope you have fun with it. Um, there will be more detailed photographs of a lot of the pieces on the website as well. Thanks a lot.